Um, for those of you who have read the abstract, actually, my, my um, talk is going to be slightly different to what I proposed in the abstract. Primarily, when I, 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 uh, I was going to talk about both instabilities in Newtonian and viscoelastic fluids, but when I put that presentation together, I thought I'd need about an hour to go through it. So instead, I'm just going to restrict myself to viscoelastic instabilities. So uh, I'm going to be talking about, for the next 30, 35 minutes, viscoelastic instabilities in the so-called cross-slot geometry, which is uh, this thing up here, which I'll explain a bit more uh, in a moment. I'll talk about mainly characterization. I'll also uh, skip exploitation because that was one thing I didn't have much time to cover as well and how to, to cure this. So um, this has been work done over a, a period of about 15 years. Um, time goes very fast when you put one of these talks together. You can't believe that the, the first time you worked on this was 2007. But um, this has been like lots of science, uh, uh, collaborative in nature. So there's been lots of co-authors who've made a uh, a lot of an impact there. So um, I just wanted to thank my co-authors there and also thank the organisers for the invitation to give uh, this talk. It's very good, uh, very good of them to do that. And also to thank them for organising an excellent talk. I think excellent uh, conference. I think Gavers worked really well. So that they may not, uh, they may have seen all the problems, but I actually think as a, as a user, it's worked really well. So thank you for doing that. Um, so over the next 35 minutes or so, I'm going to discuss uh, complex fluids. So if you're not aware of what these are, these are non-Newtonian or viscoelastic fluids. I'll explain that uh, a little bit more as we go on. This cross-slot geometry, which is basically two orthogonal uh, channels um, coming in from the east and west and leaving in the north, in the north and south. And south. Oh, I've got a bit of feedback, so somebody wants to turn the um, speakers. Uh, yeah, mute themselves. Thanks. Um, and it, it can be considered, for those of you who do Newtonian fluid mechanics, it probably doesn't look very complex. But if you do viscoelastic fluids, actually, it, we'd class this as a complex geometry, even in 2D, because it contains a mixture of uh, shear and extensional uh, deformations. Um, so we can think of it as a prototypical complex geometry, which has got these different uh, kinematics taking place. Mm -hmm. There is actually some practical uses for it used in rheological experiments and also frequently in microfluidics. Um, as I've only got 35 minutes, it's going to be rather parochial and a very uh, quick overview of some of my own work in this area. Um, it's primarily numerical, but we've also done a lot of experimental work, both with collaborators and in my own lab, which I won't have a chance to talk about. Um, and so I'd just like to give apologies for others who've worked on this, uh, especially those people who've looked in the cross slot before there was any uh, instabilities and also related flows. So um, please, please accept those apologies now that it's really just a very parochial view of my own work in this area. So if you're not familiar with what a viscoelastic um, fluid is, Really, they're viscoelastic liquids because all the ones that we know about are liquids, not gases. And really, because viscoelastic liquids, as the name implies, have both liquid-like and solid-like characteristics, we should really talk about these being viscoelastic materials because they can behave in both a solid-like and a viscous-like response, depending upon the time scale over which you deform them. Um, there's a whole host of viscoelastic materials. So anything, when you add some structure into the material, then tends to take it away from being Newtonian. So we do Newtonian fluid mechanics as undergraduates because basically low molecular weight uh, fluids and liquids behave like Newtonian um, fluids to a very good approximation. So things like water and air, and they're the most two most abundant uh, fluids, the most abundant uh, liquid and the most abundant gas on the planet. And so Newtonian fluid mechanics will get you a long way uh, looking at uh, water and air. But then when you either add anything, so if you put a polymer into solution, for example, it becomes viscoelastic. If you put small um, surfactant-like molecules together that are very small in solution, you put them in at low enough concentration, basically they'll reduce the surface tension, but otherwise have no role. Um, if you increase the concentration, then the surfactant molecules will start to uh, come together and form what are called micelles. And then if you increase it still further, those micelles will form longer worm-like micellar fluids and they behave then very much like polymers. So things like shampoo and conditioners are worm-like micellar fluids and they have very strong viscoelastic uh, properties, paints, printing inks. You get the idea, there's many thousand of, of these. Um, also in our own body, uh, blood is, is slightly viscoelastic. It's a suspension at about 40% uh, by volume of uh, deformable red blood cells in a slightly uh, elastic um, matrix, which is um, plasma. Synovial fluid, the fluid between your joints, saliva is actually really viscoelastic and actually DNA in solution is a, is a rigid polymer and, and viscoelastic. So these have a whole host of uh, applications. So I'm going to be restricting myself here to talking about purely elastic cases. Purely elastic, what we mean by that is that inertia is not important. So in an experiment, we'll have uh, inertia will be finite but small. 
and in a numerical calculation we're fortunate enough that we can exactly turn that off and go to the the Reynolds equal to zero the creeping flow case um, and so this all all my work in this area was motivated by these beautiful experiments by Paolo Aratia and co-workers that appeared in uh, PRL in 2006. So here's that cross slot geometry. We've got flow coming in from the east and west. One of the uh, uh, fluid is dyed and the other one isn't. And then you can see that basically if the Reynolds number is low, as you might expect, it's very boring. The flow splits equally. It's diffusion dominated. It's linear and reversible. If I didn't put these arrows on here using this um, dye injection technique, you wouldn't be able to tell whether flow was coming in from the east and west and leaving from the north and south or coming in from the north and south and leaving from the east and west. That's a, a characteristic of the fact that at low Reynolds number, um, the creeping flow equations are linear and reversible. Here's some particle tracking. Um, this was in a, a cross slot with an approximately square cross section, um, but that's not too crucial for what we'll see. And then instead of using a, a, a Newtonian fluid, they then went um, to use a viscoelastic fluid. And what they saw was the Reynolds number was kept very low. So it's still creeping flow above a certain flow rate. And um, this Deborah number is a, a way of um, characterizing that non-dimensionalizing that flow rate for viscoelastic fluids. They saw a bifurcation to a steady asymmetric state. So the geometry is perfectly symmetric. The flow rate is um, perfectly symmetric as well as it can be to experimental tolerances. The flow rate is completely symmetric as well as it can be to experimental tolerances. At low uh, uh, flow rates, it remains um, steady and symmetric like the Newtonian case, but above a certain flow rate, you got this very interesting breaking of stability where the flow remained steady, but it was asymmetric. As they kept increasing the flow rate still further, then that steady uh, pattern gave way to a time dependent um, flow, and then it acted like a little paddle and it enhanced the mixing. So they they said they proposed that this was a an ideal micro mixer at, at, in microfluidics, for example. It did depend upon the type of polymer used. So a polyacrylamide, which is a highly flexible linear polymer, um, showed this instability. Xanthangum, which you've probably all eaten, xanthangum, it's in uh, tomato ketchup as a thickener. Um, but it's much more rigid, rigid and much less elastic, remained uh, symmetric over the conditions they could reach. OK, so the open questions when they published this was, uh, as always, I guess, when you're a, an experimentalist, as I kind of primarily am, I would say, people always then start to be into question of, oh, well, are you sure your geometry is exactly symmetrical? Um, you know, are you sure your flow rates are exactly right? Is this a real effect? Um, this would be a pretty boring talk if it, if it wasn't. It was just due to an experimental error. So, so we can probably answer that quite quickly. Um, but then actually, can you predict this numerically? So it's a really cute result, but um, can you predict this numerically? Because here the, there's some inertia still. Um, so do you need inertia or do you see, is it purely elastic? And of course, in a numerical simulation, you can, um, you can turn off inertia entirely. And then because there's no equivalent of the Newtonian constitutive equation in viscoelastic fluid mechanics. There's just different um, constitutive equations you can pick. There's no kind of one which is right for all materials. What's the physics in there that you need to observe it? And then can you get to the mechanism? Is it due to the fact that you've got a stagnation point right in the geometric center here? You can see that there. Uh, somebody could just mute themselves and get a bit of feedback. Um, and then, um, or is it due to the fact you've got curved streamlines coming around this corner? Um, and it's well known for viscoelastic fluids. If you have curved streamlines, then there is a mechanism for instability. But in here, because at the stagnation point, you can accumulate a lot of elastic stress. You might imagine the instability is due to that rather than curved streamlines. Um, but it's difficult to get at the mechanism from the experimental results alone. So can the numerics help you get to that? OK, so I'll just give you a crash course of the numerical uh, method and uh, models that um, we've used to look at this. So we're going to assume the flow is isothermal and incompressible. Then we've got the usual uh, conservation equations of mass and momentum, except that I'm going to put the left hand side identically equal to zero um, to model creeping flow. We're also going to assume that the continuum hypothesis is still valid and so though we can use um, continuum equations. You remember seeing the scale in here is about uh, 500 microns deep by about 650 microns wide. And that's um, good enough that we, we're still many orders of magnitude above what you'd need to be where non continuum effects would start to be important. Uh, so we're going to assume that continuum hypothesis is still valid. And then what we're going to do is going to take the simplest viscoelastic model that we can think of, which is the so-called upper convective Maxwell model. 
This is the same as the so-called Oldroy B model in the limit that there's no solvent viscosity. So we've got tau is a stress tensor, which you'll be familiar with from Newtonian fluid mechanics. The right hand side here is just the viscosity times a strain rate or rate of deformation tensor. The new bit is this lambda, which is a relaxation time times by tau with this um, upper convected derivative above it. OK, so it's called an upper convected Maxwell model because it's a Maxwell model and it's got this upper convected derivative. So Maxwell was the first person um, that actually observed viscoelastic behavior and he postulated a very simple model. So he observed um, he was looking at silk threads subject to a loading. And when he removed that loading, he saw an immediate elastic recall and then a much slower um, process, which was much more like a, um, a, a, a viscous response where it then changed length over a much longer time scale. And he postulated that then that was due to a viscoelastic response. And so he just took uh, Newtonian's um, viscous law and Hooke's law for the stress and he added those linearly. OK, and so that's Maxwell's uh, linear viscoelasticity model of the simplest thing you can think of. You take Newtonian uh, constitutive equation for the stress and the hook, Hooke's law for an elastic stress. You add them together linearly and you get the Maxwell model. Um, the big issue with that is it's not um, frame invariant or it's not objective. So if I put that model on a turntable, say, and I rotate my turntable, then I'll get different results, which we do not want that the result is dependent upon a, a solid body rotation. And the person who figured out what you actually had to do was James Oldroyd in 1950, who said, well, actually, instead of this uh, simple time derivative here, what you need to take into account is a coordinate system which is moving, rotating and stretching with the fluid. And this gives rise to this upper convective derivative. Um, and that's the proper way to handle these things such that the equation is then objective. Um, that's what it looks like written out um, a bit longer. It's called a quasi linear model because it's linear in um, stress. And I would argue it's arguably the simplest differential model that can predict many features of viscoelasticity. It's got one big problem, and that's that in um, uh, steady state purely extension, so purely stretching flows, there's no um, limiting uh, force. So uh, in effect, the um, fluid can um, give you a singularity and an infinite stress beyond a critical strain rate. OK, so. We can have more complex models which fix that, but they all go back to this model in that in that limit. And so we'll try and work on this model. And the reason for working on this model, it's got very few free parameters and it's only got the key ingredients of first normal stress difference and um, relaxation processes. Um, and if you can predict it with this, you can predict it with more complex models, but you've got more nonlinear parameters. To give you an idea of what the more complex models look like, they look like this. So basically, you can have the Oldroyd B model where you add in a solvent viscosity. You can then have nonlinearity um, to the model to limit this uh, maximum stress and to give you shear thinning of the shear viscosity, for example, either due to the Fantien Tanner model or what's called finite extensibility, and that's due to um, Chilton and Rallison in, in this particular formulation. Um, so, the kind of main message from this you can go more complicated, you can get more nonlinear parameters. They will all go to the super convective Maxwell model in some limit. Okay, so the first point of call is to go there or to the old B, add in a solvent and see if you can observe it there. We could also do this in terms of a confirmation tensor. The reason that we might do uh, want to do that is for uh, numerical stability. These equations are actually uh, very challenging to solve and they suffer from something called the high Weisenberg number problem that many codes just diverge at a finite value of the flow rate, even in, in creeping flow. And so what we do is work in terms of this confirmation tensor and we um, then work in terms of logarithm for that to reduce uh, stress gradients. Um, other than that, it's a fairly standard finite value method. Um, we use higher order schemes for the convective terms, which are important, even in the creeping flow limits, because you've got these convective terms in the constitutive equations, even if they're missing from the momentum equation. Um, the last results I'll show were um, conducted using um, uh, an open source tool. This for the, the first set of results are an in-house code the open source tool, Rio tool in OpenFOAM has many of these same things implemented. So if you're interested, you can go and, and download that. So let's just uh, um, orientate ourselves to the problem statement. So as I said, inlets are always east and west. Outlets are always north and south. We'll put our coordinate system in the geometric center. We'll have an average velocity U in the two dimensional um, problem. There, there's only one length scale, which is H. We'll put the axes at the cent geometric center of the domain. 
Uh, the Reynolds number, which is not going to be important, the problems we're going to look at of inertia to viscous, we're going to put that identically to zero. And then for viscoelastic fluids, we've actually got two non-dimensional numbers which are important. The Deborah number, which is a ratio of time scales, fluid to flow, and the Weisenberg number, which is a, a ratio of elastic to viscous stresses. So uh, the Deborah number, which is a ratio of um, a relaxation time here, lambda, divided by a characteristic uh, time for the flow, because we've only got one length scale in the problem, if we try and estimate that time scale, which might be the time it takes for a fluid particle to go around this corner, for example, we end up with something like H over U for time scale. And so when we put that in, we get lambda U over H. Actually, at the stagnation point here, um, the residence time in theory for a fluid particle, because it's a stagnation point, is in fact infinite. OK, so at the stagnation point, we're going to have Deborah equal to zero, so we can get steady state properties whereas elsewhere we're going to get it varying. But if we want to do it from a dimensional perspective, we just get U over H. For the Weisenberg number, when we work that through as a ratio of elastic to viscous stresses for the UCM model, we just get lambda U over H, which is just this relaxation time times by a characteristic strain rate. And again, because we've only got one velocity and one length scale, we only can get one uh, time scale or one characteristic strain rate for that. So that's why we get Deborah and Weisenberg number being the same in this problem, even though they characterize different things. So um, people will often use Deborah and Weisenberg number interchangeably. They don't tell you exactly the same thing. Um, but in problems where you only have a single length scale, you can't actually uh, differentiate them. OK, so that's our equivalent of the Reynolds number, because Reynolds number is zero here, is going to be the Weisenberg number or the Deborah number. It gives you a ratio of the kind of nonlinearity in the problem as that goes up. Um, Deborah number or Weisenberg number equal to zero is just going to be a Newtonian fluid. And as that goes up, that's going to drive nonlinearity, but nonlinearity from the constitutive equation, not from the momentum equation. Um, we've also got this ratio of the solvent to total viscosity. For the UCM model, there is no solvent. We just assume it's full polymer. And the three dimensional results, which I've removed to save time, we've characterized with a depth aspect, aspect ratio. For the Newtonian base case, can we simulate that? We would hope so. And um, so this is what it looks like. Uh, so in the 2D limit, as I talked about in Arata's experiments, it's linear and reversible. And if you could, if I didn't tell you which way the flow was going, coming in from the east and west and leaving from the north and south, you'd never be able to tell. There's lots of symmetries in this flow. So there's mirror symmetries along the y and the x-axis and along x is equal to uh, y and x is equal to minus y. And it's rotationally symmetric. Um, OK. So now we go and do the UCM model and we're just so the experiments were a real polymer solution, which has some shear thinning as a finite um, extensional viscosity as a solvent in there because we've made it from um, dissolving some high molecular weight polymers in uh, water glycerol. We're going to neglect most of that and we're just going to have this very simple UCM model, which gives us a constant viscosity, which is just all polymer. There's no solvent, gives us some normal stresses which are quadratic. And it gives us an extensional viscosity, which if we go above a particular strain rate can blow up. Um, and we're just going to increase the flow rate. And as we do that, so this is a Newtonian result where the Deborah number is equal to zero. And we'll see what happens as we increase the flow rate. So we're increasing the flow rate, same symmetric, keep symmetric bang. And there we get the breaking of symmetry. The flow is still staying steady. This is just increasing the flow rate. So we get a steady solution. Then I'm just superimposing the results on that again. So and we keep increasing at a certain value of the Deborah number, we'll get a, an unsteady flow and the simulations will just stop. Let's just show that again. So when I click go, what you'll see is the streamlines move slightly towards the corners and then at a critical value, you'll see that they break symmetry. So around about 0.3, suddenly now you've got a breaking of symmetry and we've got more flow leaving from the, um, the west inlet from the south coming in from the west and leaving from the south and more coming in from the east and leaving from the north. OK, so although we've done a 2D simulation and the real experiments were 3D, and we've taken this very simple model. Um, we're able to capture this qualitatively. Um, so it tells us, yes, it's a real effect. Yes, it's purely elastic because here we've turned off inertia and the minimal thing that you need is just elasticity. You don't need shear thinning. You just need some uh, model which is viscoelastic to pick this up. Um, you might be saying, well, why does it break one way and not the other if it's perfectly symmetric? Well, actually, there'll always be some finite round off error in your code, for example. And so depending upon the initial condition, we could either get it breaking one way or the other. So it's by bi bi-stable in that, that sense. There are there are two solution branches. 
But beyond that critical flow rate of about 0.31, the symmetric solution branch is no longer stable. Um, and it appears to be a linear instability. So we need a vanishingly small perturbation will kick it into um, the either of these states. There's no hysteresis either. So if we increase the flow rate or the Deborah number, go to an asymmetric state and then decrease it, we return to the same symmetric solution um, at the same uh, Deborah number. And as I said, as we go to higher um, flow rates, exactly as we saw in the experiment, it becomes uh, time dependent. So we want to quantify the degree of asymmetry so we can look at the nature of the asymmetry. So what we're going to do is just say, well, in a perfectly symmetric flow, the inlet arm here from the east, the flow would split equally into Q1 and Q2. And from the uh, inlet arm from the west, it would speak, split equally into Q1 and Q2 because we're conserving the total amount of uh, mass that flows out. These Q1 and Q2 have to sum to be total Q. So we'll just do the difference and we'll call that DQ. For a perfectly symmetric flow, this DQ has to be zero. And for a completely asymmetric flow, plus or minus one. So this is what I was talking about here. We see we can get these two solution branches beyond about 0.315. We can no longer go along the, the steady um, symmetric branch, but we get these two steady asymmetric branches. Um, it's supercritical. So if we look at this, it fits very well with a square root law. And that solid line through there is a square root. So that tells us it's a, a linear instability and it's so-called supercritical or forward bifurcation. If we add a little bit of inertia, we can delay. We can push this um, instability to higher uh, values of the Deborah number. And if we go up to Reynolds number of three, that completely calms the instability and the flow remains uh, steady and symmetric. Um, what we can also do is to then begin to think about what's the mechanism for this. Could it be that the flow somehow knows at that stagnation point we're generating a lot of elastic stress? The polymer molecules are being stretched out. If we think about this as a polymer, um, and does the flow somehow know that if we break symmetry, we can consume less energy? So to do that, we can characterize the pressure drop required to drive the flow through a so-called quet correction. And we do that between the pressure drop from one inlet to one outlet minus what the pressure drop would be if the flow was just fully developed channel flow, normalized by the wall shear stress in a fully developed channel flow. And the reason that we do this, so in the engineering literature, you might be used to seeing pressure drops, you know, normalized by a half rho v squared as a kind of um, uh, a loss coefficient. In here, we don't use a half rho v squared because it's creeping flow. So um, inertia is playing no role. And the quet correction is a very helpful thing to think about because actually if the quet correction is one, that's telling us in this case, for example, in the cross slot, the energy required or the pressure drop required to drive flow from P1 to P2. If the quet correction is one, that's telling us we could replace this cross slot by a channel of the same length um, plus one. So when it's quet correction of zero, it's saying that the, the pressure drop required to drive the flow at that flow rate through this cross slot corner is just the same as a channel, the same length. If it's equal to one, it's just one additional height on that length. So it gives you a very intuitive feeling of how much extra pressure is being consumed. So what we can see is when we plot this correct correction, mm -hmm. we go up through a maximum and when it becomes asymmetric, um, it does actually consume less energy. Now in an experiment, of course, we can never access this part of the parameter space because the flow will always become asymmetric. But in a numerical experiment, we can force symmetry on the flow. So we can put a symmetry boundary condition there and just model a quarter of the geometry. And actually, that's why this um, was never observed numerically before our work, because people just assumed it would always be symmetric, so forced symmetry on the flow. If we do that, you can see that the um, pressure drop continues to rise monotonically beyond that. So in breaking symmetry, going to a steady asymmetric state, it actually consumes less energy. So you could think about this, that it, it, it's a kind of an energy minimization. The fluid knows that actually if I break symmetry, it's going to consume less energy to flow at the same average flow rate through this geometry. Um, there are some instances, though, where um, this doesn't kind of explain it um, because there isn't always a kind of general energy minimization um, process. What we can also look at is the type of flow. So I talked about this being a prototypical kind of complex geometry where it's got mixed shear and extension. And so we can characterize that with a so-called flow type uh, parameter model. So we do that using the rate of deformation tensor and the vorticity tensor. 
Um, when this is zero, it's pure shear. When it's minus one, it's solid body rotation. And when it's red, it's pure extension. So at the stagnation point, we've got pure extension. Then we've got extension dominated around that. It's perfectly symmetric in the upstream and downstream channels. We've just got pure shear. Um, when we break symmetry, then we've got, instead of being an extensional dominated flow, we do have a, a shear dominated flow. So both of these last key results would kind of tell you that it's probably something to do with a stagnation point, that the flow doesn't like all the stress that is accumulated at the stagnation point, and that if it breaks symmetry, it can relieve that stress, the pressure drop required to drive the flow can go down, and then at the end of it, you've got a more shear dominated flow than extension dominated flow. So I'd say, um, we did many other works beyond this, but I would say the open questions at 2019, so 10 years after this initial paper or so, um, were still, well, is it due to the stagnation point or classic curve or this classic curve streamlines instability? What's the precise mechanism? We think it might be due to this stagnation point. We've got some energy minimization arguments, but we don't really know. And can we control it? So that's going to be the um, second part of my tour in the last 10 minutes or so. So what we're going to do is try and control it. This is the motivation. And in so doing, we actually found out what the, the mechanism was that was governing this. OK, so in the, the, the simple cross slot, what we've got at that stagnation point. So this is just to indicate at this point, which is the geometric center, we've got a stagnation point. So both velocity components are equal to zero. That's exactly what stagnation point means. But the strain rate is non-zero and it's roughly equal to two times U over H. And that's because you've got flow coming in from the uh, west, uh, which is being opposed by flow in the opposite direction coming in from the east. So over some distance, which is about 2H, goes from the, the centre fully developed uh, centre line value, which is about 1.5 times the average velocity to minus 1.5 times the, the average velocity. And the distance over it, what it does, that gives you a strain rate of about 2U over H. Okay. Um, also, in the in when we have the cross, as I talked about, because we've got a stagnation point, we get... Um, infinite residence time there in effect and so we can get to this steady state blow up in the extensional stresses although we did simulations to prove you got exactly the same result even when you used a finite extensibility model so that wasn't the cause of the instability um, but anyway in the, the basic uh, cross lot you can build up a lot of stress there because you've got an infinite residence time so that the molecule has got a lot of time to build up a lot of strain there um, when you add a cylinder which is what we're going to do now to give a passive control mechanism We've now got um, uh, um, stagnation points again, where U will be equal to V will be equal to zero all the way around the, the cylinder because of the no slip condition. But actually the strain rate now at those stagnation points is zero, okay? Um, let's just get rid of that. Um, and I'll just explain why that is now. So if we just zoom in um, very closely just on one of these stagnation points where we can forget about the curvature of the cylinder and just assume that it's a flat plate, then at the wall, the vertical velocity um, component is zero because of the impenetrability um, condition. So uh, no flow can go across the wall. And so therefore, there's also no uh, velocity gradient because V is zero all the way along that. And so dV dy is equal to zero. Um, then the continuity equation for an incompressible liquid would give you that du dz is equal to zero. The strain rate is nothing but du dz. So if you've got a solid wall there, which is impenetrable, although you've got a stagnation point, you've also got at the same point a um, zero um, strain rate or zero stretching. As you move some distance away, you'll get some stressing, but there the velocity components will be non-zero, so you don't get to these very large stresses. You can also do the same using a, a polar cylindrical coordinates and just show this. It's just easier to show it in cartoons in there, but you get the same result. So if we do some simulations, um, this is using one of those different uh, models, but don't worry about the details. Phi is the blockage ratio, so um, the ratio of the diameter of this cylinder in here to the um, width of the cylinder. You can see the black dash curved here is when we have no cylinder. We have at, at zero, we have a finite strain rate. We're going to renormalize the distance away as we add a cylinder to be the distance away from the cylinder rather than the, the geometric center. And you can see that all the strain rates go to zero. As we change the blockage, we get a different um, variation of this strain rate, but they all go to zero at the cylinder. So we're fundamentally changing the flow around about that stagnation point by adding the cylinder, which is the key result I want you to take away from this. So let's go to a case now where we've got the steady asymmetry here without the cylinder. And let's add the cylinder and keep increasing the cylinder diameter, holding everything else fixed. So we'll keep the flow rate fixed and the fluid fixed. 
And what you can see is adding the cylinder, as you increase the diameter, you return symmetry to the flow such that there's a critical uh, diameter at this value of the Weisenberg number where it, the flow becomes um, steady and symmetric again. So the cylinder stabilizes the flow. Um, if we plot the square of this um, asymmetry parameter, we can see locally it's linear, which again tells us it's supercritical. So it doesn't change the nature of the instability. There's no hysteresis still, and it still says supercritical. And you can see the critical Weisenberg number being pushed to the right as this um, the diameter of the cylinder increases. Now let's look at this. So this Five is very, minutes. thank you. Um, now let's look at this in terms of the critical value of the Weisenberg number for different um, blockages. So as we increase the blockage ratio, so the cylinder gets bigger, we get a marked uh, increase in the critical Weisenberg number. So the red indicates steady asymmetric flow, the blue is steady symmetric. But actually once we go down below about 40%, the effect on the critical Weisenberg number is small. And then the limit where the cylinder is about 5%, there's basically no effect. So low blockage, there's no effect which is kind of surprising because if it is due to the stagnation point, I've just spent a number of slides really laboring this point that the flow there is fundamentally changed. Okay, so it begins to tell us, well, maybe it's not to do with the stagnation point. So we then, um, so we've answered the thing of how do you control it? One of the methods is to use a cylinder. Now we're gonna look at the data that we get where we have a very small cylinder to see if we can find out something about the mechanism. So uh, what we did was to look at the velocity difference between the field and it's the magnitude between um, the uh, no cylinder minus the 10% cylinder, and you can see very much the, the changes in the flow field are very much localized around the cylinder. But as you move away from the cylinder around the corner where the, the, the streamlines are curved, there's very little difference. Okay, so we're saying if it was due to the stagnation point, this is very strange because the changes there is significant, but away from there, it's less to do with that. And then again, the beauty of numerical experiments, you can also say, well, you know, at the cylinder, we've got that zero strain rate because we've got the slip condition. Basically, we've got no slip. OK, so what happens if we introduce a slip condition there and we did complete slip? So the blue uh, solid line is what it, the Newtonian calculation looks like with a standard no slip calculation. The dashed line is what it looks like. Well, when we give it complete slip and you can see in the Newtonian case, there's a massive change in the strain rate at the, the cylinder. In the viscoelastic case, now there's a finite strain rate at the cylinder, but after a very short distance here of about 0.01 um, of a channel height, you basically have no effect. And then this is the difference between the slip and the no slip result again. And once again, we see that if you have that slip boundary condition, totally changes what's going on at the stagnation point, but the critical Weisenberg number is, is not changed at all. So that really tells us it's likely to be a um, a curved streamlines instability, which are governed by this so-called Pactel mckinley criteria here. I haven't got time to go into that, but uh, in a very long analysis, which is actually published in this 2019 JFM paper, we were able to show that if it was a curved streamlines analysis, we sh a curved streamlines instability, we should get a functional dependence of one over the critical Weisenberg number going like the blockage ratio squared, um, and then so that's what it should like look like analytically. We we can't say anything about A and B from the theory. We can just say that they should be constants. And then our numerical results are in blue and the red line is this analytical fit. So what we're able to do is going after when we're trying to control the flow, really understand where that, that mechanism is com coming from. So I would say we, in this paper, we're finally able to answer the question that is it due to the stagnation point or is it just a classical curve streamlines instability? I guess somewhat disappointingly, um, we can show that it's uh, not different to, to lots of the other purely elastic instabilities which have been um, seen in a whole host of geometries where there were curved streamlines, um, but we can actually put it, uh, show that quite nicely it falls under this uh, curve streamlines uh, paradigm. So let's sum that up. So we can see steady symmetry breaking in the cross slot at vanishingly small Reynolds numbers for viscoelastic fluids. Um, the experiments where these were first observed was had a real polymer molecule which exhibits shear thinning. It exhibits both first and second normal stress differences. It has a finite value of the extensional viscosity um, and the geometry was roughly square in cross section. We got rid of a lot of that complexity as a first approximation. We were able to capture everything qualitatively using a 2D, very similar, similar kind of phenomenological model using the upper convective Maxwell model. Um, 
We have gone beyond that and done much more complicated models. We've looked at the effect of finite aspect ratio. Actually, we see that there's actually a small island of 3D geometries where you get this steady asymmetry. And if you're too, um, if you're too a low aspect ratio, you transition straight to the unsteady flow. So Arati was quite lucky being in the right regime. You could call it luck or you could call it good insight. Um, but I've not had time to go through that. I wanted to try and go through things a bit slower. We've shown that if you add a cylinder that controls the onset and it really helps you reveal the mechanism that it's purely elastic and it's not driven from the stagnation point, even though you get very large stresses at the stagnation point. So although when you bifurcate, the stresses go down at the stagnation point and the flow changes type, that's just um, kind of a consequence of the curved streamlines instability, not the driving uh, force. We've also been able to show that inertia stabilizes the flow. In other results, the um, the exploitation, we've been able to show that you can use this to enhance heat transfer massively. We've also shown in a very recent JFM paper that we can use interfacial tension um, to stabilize the flow. And if we have one of the inlet streams being elastic and one of the inlet streams being uh, Newtonian, we can actually stabilize the flow very significantly and get very large increases in the critical flow rate. I'll just put up um, a, a list of the papers that I've published on the topic there and I'll be available now to answer any questions.